former UFC Pride, Bama, WFA. I'll stop right there because he, the following guest has been there and he's beaten people up in it. And let's get right to it. It's Twinkle Toes himself. Frank Trigg joins us today. Frank, how are you? Doing good. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So can we talk about your fight career started right now? Um, I see you haven't had a fight in a while or uh, a huge fight inside a huge organization for a while. Are you retired? Are you still going or what's happening? No, I'm looking for fights. There's no one's hiring. Uh, my last fight was in Bama back in September, and I haven't had a fight since then. Um, I think I still have one fight left in my contract with Bama, but I can pursue other areas. They just don't have the money for the contract that we signed. They don't have the money to pay me that I'm supposed to get. So that, that's the issue we're going through. And then I get an offer probably once a week, or excuse me, once a month, sometimes twice a month for a fight, but the money is so low. I commentate and I do so much analysis work that when I'm commentating and doing analysis work, that I get paid a certain rate. And then the amount that these guys are offering me to fight is that same rate. Well, the fight, I need an eight-week training camp. But in eight weeks, I can every weekend, I can work for somebody. I can do an analysis job or a commentating job. But in that eight weeks, I can only fight once. It's like, well, why would I get, take the risk of getting punched in the head, getting cut, getting, you know, getting beat up for one week's pay when I can actually make that over the eight weeks? I can make that times eight. So that's just kind of been the dilemma is just, you know, I'm, I'm looking for fights. I'm trying to get fights. I'm training guys, getting them ready. I trained uh, Martin Campman to get ready for his fight. I was one of his training partners, not a coach. Uh, Jay Haran, same thing, one of his training partners. Uh, and uh, with um, I'm helping Ryan Couture get ready right now for his fight. And it's been – I'm actually more of a coach and a partner for Ryan, trying to help him get ready. So I've taken a bigger role. Um, Randy actually asked me to uh, – and Ryan did too, asked me to kind of step up a little bit. So I'm helping them get ready. And, and it's uh, – you know, I, I'm in shape. You know, I'm not in shape to fight tomorrow night, but I'm in shape. My weight's down. You know, I'm walking around about 190, 192. Uh, it's just, just not the right amount of money. I'm at the money phase of my career. I'm at the rampage phase of my career. It's got to be the right amount of money, otherwise I'm not going to do it. We're speaking with Frank Trigg. You can follow him online on Twitter, at Frank Trigg, as well as uh, www.franktrigg.com. Actor, analyst, mixed, mixed martial artist, coach, trainer. He does it all. Frank, did you catch uh, the UFC from this past weekend? I did. Yeah, absolutely, I did. Yeah. Uh, before we get into the main event, can we talk about uh, Henderson Machida? Weird fight. I thought that Henderson won the first round, did enough to win the first round, but Machida gets that last takedown in, in like eight seconds left in the round or nine seconds left in the round to steal the round from what the final judges finally come out with. I think Henderson wins the first, and clearly wins the third. Machida wins the second. It's the first round. you got to kind of go, eh, I'm not real sure what happened. I think Dan did more than enough to win the first round. Um, it's unfortunate because Lyoto now is on one of those things where, you know, the UFC is cutting guys left and right. They came out and said they just cut 16 guys. They said they need to cut 100 more, you know, or they're going to cut between 85 more because they need to cut 100 total. Uh, guys, Matt Riddle just failed another drug test. He gets cut. Because, even though he won his last fight, he's getting cut because he failed a drug test. Henderson could be up for up for up for disposal. Uh, Leonardo Machida, even though he won, but he won in a boring fashion. Though Danny kept chasing him and chasing him down, trying to go after him. Danny, you know, Machida could be up up on the chopping block as well. It's it's like one of those deals. Now you never know when the when Zufa when the UFC is going to cut you. you. You don't know what's going to happen with you anymore. And and I, I believe that Danny did enough. I think Danny did enough to, to win the fight. Um, I like both guys. Uh, I'm, I'm friends with both guys, but I'm closer friends with Danny. I am with, with Lyoto, um, but I think I think that Dan did more than enough to, to win that fight. Uh, he outstruck him. If you look at the combi if you look at the, the fight metrics, he out he he threw more punches and more kicks, and he, he beat um, Lyoto to every punch and every kick. And, and the only thing that, that Lyoto wins in the striking game is that he wins the significant strikes, the majority, the big powerful strikes. He had more like five or six more throughout the entire fight than Dan did, but Dan hit him a, beat him in every other position. Um, they both had a takedown, but Leto's takedown comes with eight seconds left, and not, the bell rings. Nothing happens. Dan takes Leto down in the third round, and holds him down, and beats him up. Like it was, a, it was a whole process. So I really think that Dan wins that fight. But uh, you know, in California, the judges are always suspect. They're always going to be a problem when they're in California, and they, and they were this time. The one problem we didn't have is with the referees. We had the best referees that, that you can have. You can ask for in uh, Herb Dean, uh, Big John McCarthy, and uh, and um, uh, who's the other one? Uh, Darn it. I was just talking about Timothy. Anyway, the, 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 refs, the refs are the best that, that you could possibly have in that mix. And then it's the judges that kind of screwed things up in this one. And at least I believe that. I got an argument on Twitter. A lot of guys think that, that, that the Machida won clearly. Like he won all three rounds. I'm like, I, don't, you know, I don't know what they're talking about, but you know, that's how the game goes. 
What's it like for a fighter, in your opinion, uh, when it comes to social media? Do you think it's good for the brand? Because you were just talking about a fighter saying something. You can easily walk the line on Twitter or on Facebook or on something. How do you feel about fighters and social media? I love social media, man. That's how I've stayed relevant, you know, in the last three years. Like, social media has stayed relevant. I've had as many as 175,000 followers at one time on Twitter, and I'm down to around 120,000. So you lose people, you gain people. It's just, it's the game. Like, you say something, you're talking about a certain topic, and a bunch of people that aren't part of MMA will start following you, and then they drop off the map. You know, like, a lot of people started following, like, Volkman and, and Chell Sonnen when, when the presidential committee was, the presidential elections were going on, because they're talking about the Republican side of it. So down here in the States, people are paying attention to that because the presidential election was going on. This guy's very vocal and this guy's very vocal. So they get all these new followers that follow him. Then all of a sudden, the election's over and all those followers fall off because you're not talking about the same stuff anymore. You're talking about fights and, and this, this fight dentist and this, this tap-out clothing line. Like, I don't even know what that is. And then all of a sudden, so those followers go away. Now those followers come on because all of a sudden, now you're on the tough show. And it's just it's this game. Oh, and all of a sudden, your name is mentioned again because you just got cut. From UFC, and then everyone's sad, so they're following you. Now, oh, you got picked up by the World Series of Fighting. Now they're going to follow you more. It's just, it's this game that goes on with social media. Guys like Miguel Torres, he got fired from the UFC because of what he said on on uh, social media. Uh, uh, Force Griffin had to do like he he went and volunteered and did like twenty hours of community service because of what he said on social media. And Forrest was just trying to make it aware to all of his followers that in society now. We're allowing these certain things to go on, and we think it's okay. And he was raising it to our attention. He's trying to—he was trying to prove a point. He was trying—he's trying to educate us as fans of his of what was going on. And what he said, he said it wrong, and he got fired for it because so many people took offense to it. Miguel Torres was making a joke about a show that we all watch. That 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 he turned me on to that show. Uh, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia because of what the, the humor he was using from the show, but it was offensive to some people. And, and he got fired from the UFC. Now it's this whole deal where you have to be careful on your social media. The thing that I do is don't swear and only talk about the stuff that interests you. It's, some of it's going to be controversial. Some of it's going to, some of it's going to, you know, some of it's going to go against somebody else's beliefs. Somebody else, you're going to, you're going to irritate everybody. You can't please all of the people all the time. You can barely please some of the people some of the time. You know, just, just stick to being you and you'll be fine. Because you have to have your own voice. You have to be you. We're not actors. We're athletes. So we have to have our own voice. We have to have our own spacing out there. You know, we have to talk about the stuff we talk about. Like Randy Couture is a huge favorite on, on social media, but he never talks about anything personal. He does the seminar he's going to. He's talking about the, the working out with Neil uh, Melanson. He's talking about working out with Ryan Couture. He's about working out with these other guys and doing this thing at the gym and doing these things. He doesn't talk about anything personal. Where I, on the other hand, I talk about everything personal. I don't, I don't care because I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to, I have nothing to run from. I have nothing to shake. I, this is who I am. This is what I do. I hang out with my kids. I go to the gym and train. I hang out and ride my bike. I go to the clubs at night when I'm in Vegas. I'm a big club head, so I go to the clubs at night. hang out with my girlfriend. That's it. That's my life. I eat, I eat dinner. I cook a lot. I read a lot. That's it. So for me, I can put everything out there personal. I think social network for, for fighters, for athletes as a whole, for anybody, anybody. I don't care if you're the local plumber. If you're the, the local, the local uh, 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 hockey skate sharpener, social networking for you because the way the world is working now, it's a very tight knit world now. Social networking is mandatory for everybody in some fashion or form. And if you're underage, you know you're, you're under that that 14 year level or that 15 year. Your parents have to be involved. This is your voice. You should be on Facebook. This is your voice that you should have on on Instagram. This is the voice and the pictures you can put out on Twitter, like that kind of thing. But yeah, social networking is mandatory for everybody now across all avenues of society. Speaking with uh, mixed martial artist Frank Trigg, you can uh, check him out on his website, franktrigg.com, and on Twitter, at Frank Trigg. Frank, you were just talking about how 85 more fighters need to be cut by Zufa, and yet they're trying to plump up their ladies' division, the bantamweight division, at 145. Uh, how do you feel about that, and how do you feel as an old-school fighter seeing two women headline uh, a fight? I didn't like it. When I first got the, got the call and, and they were like, hey, yeah, Ronda Rousey is going to fight uh, Liz Carmouche in the main event, I, I don't like it. Ronda Rousey, Sarah McMahon, uh, Kat Zingano, um, Carla Esposa, Esparza, Carla Esparza. Those are the women that made me look at women's MMA completely different than I had before. Even as a commentator, I made it very clear. I do not like this fight that's about to happen, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it like I would call any other fight. But I didn't like it. I started watching those four women, and all of a sudden I started realizing they are just like the men. They train just as hard as we do. 
They cut weight like we do. They have to wear the same gear that we do. They have the same ups and downs. They have the same problems. They, they do everything the same way the guys do. They made me fans. So during the time frame from when they made the announcement of the Ronda Rousey Liz Cambridge fight until the fight, I became a huge fan of women's MMA. So for, for the UFC to be cutting 85 fighters, 85 more fighters, and bringing in a bunch more fighters in the 145-pound division in the UFC and in the, the 135-pound division in the UFC, I'm totally fine with that. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I want to see if they can maintain because here's the cool thing about MMA and about headlining a card. If that fight was no good, nobody would be watching it and we wouldn't be talking about it right now, which means the next time no woman's going to head that card. But because Ronda Rousey and Liz Carmouche put on such a great fight and Ronda Rousey is such an amazing champ that she's going to headlight another card. And it's worth it because people are going to pay attention and realize it's not a hot chick beating up another hot chick and they're fighting each other and it's kind of fetish. And then one choke, you know, arm bars the other one, it's over. It's two female athletes battling. They changed my mindset. I'm sure they changed a lot of other guys' mindsets so throughout. They're like, eh, it's just two hot chicks. And I was like, wow, it's two girls that really know how to kick butt. Like they really know how to battle. Now, can Ronda go into the 135 pound division and win win against the top 10 guys that are there? No. I mean, you know, oh yeah, she'll beat up. Every no, she's not beating the top 10 guys at 135 pounds in the UFC. But she can maintain the bottom 20. The guy that's 15th rank, the guy that's 20th rank, the guy that's 25th rank, she can beat those guys up because she's that kind of girl. She's that kind of, she's violent in that way. She's my, has that mindset coming from judo. And so when Sir McMahon gets in there, I'm, I'm going to be impressed. I can't, I can't tell you how impressed you guys will be with Sir McMahon. And, and when that fight finally happens between, between Rousey and, and uh, McMahon, it's going to be an epic fight. It will be an epic fight. Just like all the fights with, with, uh, that we all talk about of getting these epic fights in the weight classes between like a Chris Weidman and Anderson Silva. Like that's going to be an epic fight. The fight between McMahon and, and Ronda Rousey would be an epic fight. Uh, I've got uh, just final two final questions. They're Facebook questions from some viewers. The first one's from Sahil Sani. He says, uh, where'd you get the nickname Twinkle Toes from? I've painted my toenails since like 1994. Uh, I, I, I did judo a lot too, as well as as well as well wrestling. And, and I started, I wear a really tight wrestling shoe. My toenails kept getting ripped off. Um, so I started painting them. Uh, and then I, I just kind of continued that thing when I was going on in the, in the fighting. When I first fought over in Japan, I fought uh, Marcelo Agliar in Shuto. And one of the, my manager was there, uh, Lou Ciparelli, uh, Rico's older brother, uh, Rico Ciparelli's older brother. Lou was with me and they were like, hey, you know, what about this? What about that? Whatever, blah, blah. And he started talking to some of the fans. Who's your favorite fighter? Like the bald fighter, like which one? The bald fighter with tattoos. And then he was like, well, that narrows it down to half the card. Like, oh, the, uh, the bald fighter with the twinkly toes. And it just, he's like, that's it, twinkle toes. And it just, and he ran with it. I'm trying to get rid of the nickname for 15 years. I hate it, don't like it, but it's just, it's a fact of life. Um, I've never been a big believer in guys that pick their own nickname. Uh, the fans have to pick it, and because the fans picked it and kind of worked with it, I'm just stuck with it. That's how it goes. Chris Kolick asks, because you've got two kids, would you be okay if they decided to try and compete in mixed martial arts? I have four kids, and uh, my eldest, who's 19, he's actually driving from uh, Florida tonight uh, to come up here to, to New Orleans to meet me and hang out for a, a day or two. Um, he thought about it for a minute. Uh, we'll talk about it again when he gets here, if he wants to start competing again or not. He's 19. Um, my 11-year-old daughter is not athletic at all. She has no interest in, in doing anything athletic at all, let alone you know, try to be a uh, fighter. Uh, my two little ones, Stone, my, my four-year-old, he's more of a swinger. He's more of a baseball, uh, a tennis type, type person. Uh, Lavin, my two-year-old, really likes fighting. He, he really likes punch kick. He really likes you know, going after, he likes wrestling around. He might be the fighter in the family, you know, by the time it's all said and done. But uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. If um, I'm not going to push them to go any way they go, but wherever they go, I'm going to support them. If they decide to go into fighting, I'm okay with it. That, that's their choice. But I'm not going to, you know, force them to go be that, you know, be that, that you know, Ken Norton Jr., his, his dad, Ken Norton, wanted him to be a boxer, and he just, he didn't want to be a boxer. And then he kind of went and played football instead and became a great San Francisco 49er football player. That's just what happens. You don't always do what your parents do, but they have the athletic gene, um, and we'll see what they do with it. Hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully in 20 years from now, I'll be talking about uh, one of them playing golf or playing tennis and, and they're in the big leagues. Because uh, we all know you can be top 20 in MMA and make four bucks or be top 200 in golf and make a million dollars. I want to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> Joined by Frank Trigg, mixed martial artist. He's an actor, analyst, he's a coach, he's a trainer, he's jack of all trades. Frank, thanks a lot for joining us today. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for really dealing with my schedule, too, and making this happen. I appreciate it. Not a problem.